Okay, the final item of business this evening is a members' business debate on motion 13609 in the name of Hamza Youssef on immediate recognition of the state of Palestine. The debate will be concluded without any uh, questions being put. I'd invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons uh, now or as soon as possible, and I invite Hamza Youssef to open the debate around seven minutes. Mr Youssef. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank members from across the chamber for supporting my motion today and for taking the time out of their busy campaign diaries to speak on this most important of issues. During my last speech from the front benches, I promised to continue speaking up for those whose voices have been suppressed. I hope today's motion is a clear demonstration of my, commi my commitment to do just that. Presenting officer, when discussing the issue of Israel and Palestine, there has been significant focus on the dreadful terrorist attacks on October the 7th and the atrocious killing of over 35,000 Gazans thereafter. And that focus is somewhat, of course, understandable. However, it is important to note that the violence and injustices in that region did not begin on October the 7th last year. I do not intend on in going into a detailed history of Israel and Palestine. There are far more knowledgeable people than me who have written in depth about the history of Palestine and Israel. What is, however, indisputable is that cycles of violence will continue. Many more innocent people will be killed unless we address the root causes. Unfortunately, in our lifetimes, we have seen far too many innocent people both Palestinian and Israeli killed due to the international community's failure to bring about peace in the Middle East. At the core of this failure is a broken promise, a promise made as hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were expelled by force from their homes 76 years ago. My wife's relatives are just one of those families who had to leave their home in the West Bank and flee to Gaza, clutching their keys to their home in their hand, in the forlorn hope that one day they would be allowed to return. For decades, the promise the international community has made has been to a two-state solution. But instead of progress towards that goal, we've seen the systematic occupation of Palestinian land, the expansion of illegal settlements and with it the erasure of generations of Palestinian families. There will simply be no peace in the region until the promises that were made by the international community are kept. And surely the most basic step towards keeping that promise has to be the formal and immediate recognition of the Palestinian state. You cannot claim to support peace but deny statehood to the Palestinian people. It is the very height of hypocrisy and duplicity to say that you believe in a two-state solution, but only recognise one state. There are some who try to obfuscate by invoking some mythical future process that currently doesn't exist and say that they will only recognise Palestine when the time is right. But let me be absolutely clear. The time to officially recognise the Palestinian state is right now. And it is in no one's gift, no one's gift, to veto the right of the Palestinian people. It is only through the immediate recognition of Palestine can we truly make progress towards a sovereign Palestine and Israel coexisting safely and securely alongside each other. I was pleased to see the First Minister make this point in a recent letter to both Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. And in just over a week's time, Keir Starmer is likely to be the next Prime Minister of the UK. But my appeal to him and the government he will lead is not to equivocate. Do not deny the people of Palestine their inalienable right for statehood for a second longer. Instead, ensure that UK joins with our allies, joins with our neighbours, Ireland, Norway and Spain, in immediately recognising the state of Palestine. Anything less will be a betrayal to the people of Palestine, who have been let down 
for far too long. For me, presiding officer, this has never been a question of being either pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli. It's been a question of being pro-humanity. I am left asking the question, where is our humanity? Over 37,000 Gazans, including over 14,000 children, killed. Not passing away, not dying, killed. Where is our humanity? Over 86,000 injured. Where is our humanity? The car six-year-old Hind Raja was travelling in when she was killed is alleged to have been hit by 335 bullets. 335 bullets raining down on a car full of innocent men, women and children. Where is our humanity? And if humanity is our driving force, then surely we all agree that the UK government must end the sale of arms to Israel and do so immediately. ICC prosecutors are seeking arrest warrants for both Hamas and senior members of the Israeli government, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The ICJ is considering whether or not Israel has committed the gravest of crimes, genocide. Sending arms to Israel is therefore not only morally unjustifiable, it is complicity. And we should have nothing to do with war crimes that are undoubtedly being committed. Presenting officer, accountability is the very bedrock of the global rules-based order. And if arrest warrants are issued, then the UK government must make it clear that should anyone against whom a warrant is issued including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, if they land on British soil, then they will be arrested so they can be held to account for the crimes they have been committed. Because we should be in no doubt, as the UN have recently stated, war crimes are being committed. And it is right those who are guilty, be they state or non-state actors, are held to account. I conclude, presiding officer, by asking myself how much more suffering must people endure for the violence to cease. As referenced already, over 14,000 children in Gaza have been killed. Up to 21,000 children are estimated to be missing, according to Save the Children. Many trapped beneath rubble, detained, buried in unmarked graves, or lost from their families. Hospitals obliterated, schools destroyed, UN buildings bombed. And all of this is being live streamed into our living rooms, while political leaders fail abysmally to put an end to the violence. So we must continue to raise our voice, demand a ceasefire, demand a release of all of the hostages, demand an end to arms sales to Israel, an end to the occupation, and in the immediate recognition of the state of Palestine. Future generations will ask us how on earth we allowed such a massacre to take place. At the very least, presiding officer, let us be able to say that we were on the right side of history. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, Jackson Carlaw to be followed by uh, Polly McNeill. Around four minutes, Mr Carlaw. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In the only possibly lighter moment in this debate, can I apologise for my slightly unconventionally accoutred appearance. I now know how Neil Gray felt when his trousers disintegrated on him, and I thought this was the lesser of two evils in terms of attending in the chamber this afternoon. Can I also apologise, just because of the late start of the date, that I may not be able to stay until its conclusion, and then, in substance, come to the contribution from Hamza Yusuf and congratulate him on bringing this debate. It has been some months since we last discussed this issue. And although I can't support some of the absolute propositions in the motion that he has presented to Parliament, I can associate myself very largely with the analysis that he gave in his opening third of the speech about the complete failure of the international community to honour the obligations that were made uh, long ago, but certainly at the time of the creation of the State of Israel, to a two-state solution. And what has proved to be too difficult for the minds of many in the international community has led to thousands, tens of thousands, of unnecessary deaths and the continuation of a hugely intractable, morally indefensible and appalling international position, which everybody, I think, with a moral conscience, and particularly now 
witnessing uh, the excessive deaths that are taking place can find very little to disagree with in that analysis. In my lifetime, there were major conflicts that I thought would always be irre irresolvable. The Troubles in Northern Ireland, um, the Berlin Wall and the conflagration of the Soviet Union. And yet suddenly, both of those in the late 80s and early 90s were resolved. Uh, the uh, Troubles in Northern Ireland, when the IRA agreed to decommission weapons and set aside their campaign of violence. The Berlin Wall, when the Soviet Union under Mikhail Gorbachev concluded that the international arms race couldn't be won. And for a moment, under the presidency of Bill Clinton, the prospect that there might have been progress that would have led to a more permanent settlement of these issues in the Middle East. But ultimately, because factions there could not agree, that process fell down and literally nothing has I think probably been done to resolve these issues in the years since. Now, I'm unyielding in my belief in the support of the State of Israel. Uh, I can't support the arms ban that's proposed because I fear that that would embolden Iran and I'm not necessarily sure what the nature of any conflict might escalate to be were that to happen. But I understand why people are concerned and they are concerned because while I might be unyielding in support for the State of Israel and why I might be, I should have said, enormously pleased that through the efforts of Hamza Yusuf and so many others, the Jewish community in this country, in Scotland, has not suffered as many thought it might be any of the opprobrium of what is happening there. The third leg of that stool is the Netanyahu government. And I have concerns, as have many in my own Jewish community, about the way that the Netanyahu government from which Bernie Gantz is now withdrawn, has prosecuted this conflict and share the concerns of those who think that there are concerns closer to Netanyahu's future which have allowed him to perpetuate the war in the way that he has. And that is unacceptable. So we are at a point, nine months on, where we can't all simply stand by and say this can go on for as long as it likes. We need to see the hostages released, but we also have to accept that there has to be progress towards that two-state solution. Um, I've noted the comments of Keir Starmer. They're not so very different from those of the UK government. I think they have moved to say that it would be possible to recognise a Palestinian state when a process is underway, rather than as was previously the case when a process is concluded. I, I think that is a move, not to where Mr Yusuf would like it, but a pragmatic move forward. But that requires there to be a peace process. So I also approve of all the work that Mahmoud Abbas, Abbas has done in relation to trying to put in place personalities that will be able to develop that process. But for the moment, for as long as Hamas is in place, it appears intractable. Meanwhile, there are tens of thousands of young people we see, as Hamza Yusuf said, being murdered during the course of this conflict. That too is unacceptable. So in spirit at least, I think there is a will across this Parliament, irrespective of the side of the debate we come from, to accept that what is now going on is unacceptable and progress must be made, and that progress must end with the recognition of a Palestinian state in a secure two-state environment within the Middle East. Thank you. I now call uh, Polly McNeill to be followed by Marie McNair uh, around four minutes. Ms McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to begin by thanking Humza Yusuf for his devotion to the Palestinians and for choosing this as his first debate as a former First Minister. I think it means a lot. But also to recognise, as Jackson Carlo has done, the work that he has done with the Jewish community in these very difficult times. But I believe the question of Palestine is the moral question of our time in international terms. And where you stand on the injustice of the longest occupation in the world, 76 years in fact, does matter. And millions of Israelis believe this too, and many Jewish people around the world. But I say, if you have a platform to speak out, then you must speak out for the sake of all those, as Humza Yusuf has said, who live in the Middle East region, because it is the only way in where we will get peace. As the Balfour Declaration said, amongst other things, that the creation of the State of Israel should not be done to undermine the rights of the Palestinian population. And over a hundred years on, we are no further forward. As the Palestinian ambassador Hassan Zamlot said this week at the UNICEF conference, the right to be an independent sovereign state is an alienable right for Palestinians and is not in the gift 
of the neighbour, the occupier. To, to be liberated from occupation is a long overdue right. And as Anas Arwa has said many times, the right to have a secure Palestinian state in exactly the same way that Israel should have security and peace is the right approach. But I agree with Humza Yusuf, the time to recognise Palestine is now. It's time to correct the historical injustices. And whilst the focus is rightly on the massacre and decimation in Gaza right now, it is the failure to hold Israel to account for the violation of international law over 76 years and the pretense that there was ever any serious attempt to reach a political solution must be, mis must be understood. In that time, the Palestinian representatives in the talks had accepted 22% of former Palestine as the basis of the state. And the question I think you must ask is, will Israel come to the conclusions on its own that there should be a Palestinian state without any pressure? Well, that's why I believe there must be a suspension of arms to Israel in the UK until such times as Israel complies with international law. Unless there's pressure, I don't really see how it can come about. Now, this week, Armenia has joined the 146 countries who now recognise Palestine as an occupied state. Um, so so it, that is an important uh, addition to those nations who already recognise Palestine. That's because the Armenian quarter in Jerusalem, in the old city where there is extreme settler violence, it is a risk for the Armenians to do so. But their addition to the 146 countries who recognise Palestine is important and welcome. As Huzo Yusuf has talked about, the level of violence in the occupied territories is completely unprecedented now. And whilst the world brightly focuses on Gaza, we must draw attention to what's happening in the West Bank. Benjamin Netanyahu presented a map during his speech at the United Nations in September 23, showing the all-historical Palestine um, as Israel. I'm proud of it. But Palestine exists and it will not be ignored. And I make a plea not to make the mistake of only characterising this as a problem of Benjamin Netanyahu. Previous Israel prime ministers have not uh, failed to reach um, agreement with the Palestinians. They have been repeatedly dehumanised, their rights have been taken away, they have been detained, their houses demolished. Why should they live a minute longer under Israeli rule? Just finally, presiding officer, Save the Children said that 20,000 children are estimated to be lost, disappeared, detained and buried under the rubble or in mass graves. They have nowhere to run and now one in four children is starving to death, 90% food insecure when they should be receiving aid. And now the Rafa crossing has been burned and their connection with the outside world is no longer there. Do not relent from calling from an immediate ceasefire. Continue to call for the return of the hostages still held. One day Palestine will be free, and I think this parliament can say, when the time was right, we stood up for Palestinians and for the creation of an independent Palestinian state and for peace for, for all of those who live in the region. Thank you. Before moving on, there is an awful lot of interest in this debate, as one might expect. Uh, it would be helpful if members could stick um, to their uh, speaking time allocation. Uh, we will almost certainly have to extend the debate in any event. But uh, I now call Marie McNair to be followed by Ross Greer. Up to four minutes, Ms McNair. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank my colleague Hamza Youssef for securing this incredibly important debate. Throughout his time as MSP, Hamza Youssef has shown unwavering support for the Palestinian people. And as First Minister, he showed immense leadership on this matter, and I commend him for this. At a time when other party leaders were running a mile from the issue at best, or tolerating genocide and war crimes at worst, he will be remembered on, for being on the right side of history. For decades, the Palestinian people have endured prolonged conflict and illegal occupation, which has caused immense suffering and ever-rising death toll. This lack of recognition of their statehood, despite some may argue, has resulted in continued violence and impedes the chance of lasting peace. Recognition acknowledges that Palestinians have the right to self-determination, a right to build a future free from occupation and oppression. The prospect of lasting peace has never been more in peril, so we must act urgently. 
We must secure the recognition of the State of Palestine, an immediate ceasefire and an end to arms sales to Israel and the immediate release of all hostages. Immediate recognition from the UK Government would send a powerful message, a message that we support peace and an end to the massacre of Palestinian people. Some attempt to argue that recognition of the State of Palestine could undermine the peace process, but clearly the status quo has not worked. It has only perpetuated the cycle of violence. And who are we to deny freedom to the Palestinians and condemn them to continued illegal occupation? If we believe a two-state solution is viable to get this, we must recognise the state of Palestine and allow it to coexist amongst Israel. As MSPs, it is our duty to speak up against injustice and oppression and call for action. And I thank Labour's MSPs who have signed today's motion, especially as it is in contradiction to Labour's Westminster policy that will prevail in government, unfortunately. Lip service from the Tory and Labour Party just does not cut it, and their silence has contributed to the death of many innocent Palestinians, including thousands of children and women. We in the SNP are clear on our stance on this. The next UK Government must recognise the state of Palestine as a matter of urgency. And if they refuse to do so, the SNP will force a vote on this matter in Westminster. Instead of the need for this, we are calling on them to follow in the footsteps of our neighbours in Ireland and in Spain and Norway. This move for our neighbouring countries is putting pressure on the Israeli government, but we know that unless the UK and US announce their support, little will change. The recognition of the State of Palestine is in the interest of everyone, and it is necessary for lasting peace. The Palestinian and Israeli people both deserve to live long and happy and peaceful lives, free of continuous fear and violence. And really, this should not be an extreme request. The Irish Minister Eamon Ryan put it quite simply, what the people of Palestine ask of us is not outrageous or extravagant. If anything, it is modest. The wish to be recognised as a state like any other, to control their own affairs and to speak for themselves on the international stage. It is that simple. So let us be on the right side of history today, and it's on every one of us here today, urge the next UK government to recognise the state of Palestine for lasting peace and an end to the massacre. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Ross Greer to be followed by Bill Kidd. Up to four minutes, Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And my colleagues, I'd like to thank Hamza Youssef for the moral courage and leadership that he showed in his time as First Minister and throughout his time as a member of this parliament in defending the inalienable rights of Palestinians, the rights of Palestinians that so many other world leaders would not defend. President Officer, in looking ahead at this debate, I look back at the previous speeches that I have given in this chamber on the occupation of Palestine, and one in particular. In 2018, we debated the 70th anniversary of the beginning of the Nakba, the catastrophe, the campaign of ethnic cleansing that established the State of Israel and shattered Palestinian society. And we debated that. We marked that anniversary at the same time as Palestinians in Gaza marched peacefully to the fence that Israel has used to imprison them since its siege and blockade began. They marched peacefully for their freedom and they were met by Israeli soldiers who slaughtered them. The peaceful struggle for freedom was met with colonial violence. 2018 was Scotland's year of young people and at the same time as we were marking that, 46 Palestinian children were murdered by Israeli soldiers during those protests. They were murdered alongside paramedics wearing their uniforms. They were murdered alongside people in wheelchairs, shot dead in their chairs. They were murdered alongside a journalist who was killed by Israeli soldiers, and the Israeli state then claimed that he was a senior Hamas operative. That journalist had been held in prison by Hamas. He was an opponent of Hamas who had passed American vetting to receive their support. Because of course, there is no lie that Israel is unwilling to stoop to in its constant campaign to destroy the Palestinian people. As Hamza Yusuf mentioned, Save the Children have just published a report on the toll that the last eight and nine months have taken on the children of Gaza. 20,000 lost, disappeared, detained, buried under the rubble or in mass graves. And that is years on from the debates that we've had previously about the scale of suffering that those children have had to experience. And I want to read from some of the remarks that I gave in 2018 on the experience of those children, because half of Gaza's population are under the age of 18. And over a decade into its siege, the UN estimated that at that point, 300,000 Gazan children 
were in need of psychological support. They were so traumatised by what had happened to them. That is now the case for every single of the million children in Gaza. In the 2014 Israeli assault, over 500 children were killed. And in the 10 years since then, world leaders have attended events commemorating those lost to previous genocides and slaughtered and said the same thing, never again. And 10 years later, from those 500 children being killed, we are now looking at at least 15,000 children who have been killed. Back in 2014, of those 500 children, there were four boys from one family that I have mentioned previously. They were murdered by Israel while they were playing football on the beach. They were killed by the Israeli Navy. They were clearly children, they were clearly no threat, and they were hit not by a single stray shell, but a deliberate attack. As they fled across the beach, the Israeli ship adjusted its aim and fired a second shell to make sure it had killed them all. Those children's names were Ismail Mohammed Bakir. He was nine years old. Zakaria Ahmed Bakir was 10. Ahed Atef Bakir was 10. And Mohammed Ramez Bakir was 11. Their deaths were recorded by the world's media because they were just 200 metres away in their hotel. Many journalists risked their own lives to try and save those children and the two others who were wounded with them. Of course, they can't do that now because Israel has prevented international journalists from even entering Gaza. We rely on the incredible bravery of Palestinian journalists to know what is actually happening there. Palestinian journalists, who not only themselves, but whose families are being targeted by the state of Israel as well. Israel is the only country in the world to summarily prosecute children through a military court system. But of course, not Israeli children, just Palestinian children. Those who object to Israel being labelled an apartheid state must explain why Palestinian children and Israeli children are held to such different standards. I recognise that we don't have much time in this debate, President Officer. I would just finish with a plea to the Scottish Government that it can still take further action to support the Palestinian people. It can ban the companies listed by the UN as complicit in the occupation from receiving grants and contracts. Palestinians have the right to self-determination. Recent events have shown the double standards applied to international law and human rights, but we can still stand up for our Palestinian friends. We can defend their right to a free, independent and sovereign Palestinian state. Thank you. I now call Bill Kidd to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Uh, up to four minutes, Mr Kidd. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I have stood here twice before to both condemn the terrorist attack on the 7th of October and the inhumane horrors that have since uh, taken place and continue to unfold. And it stands here for a third time is actually heartbreaking. Because to this date, this conflict has now claimed the lives of over 37,000 Palestinians. Today, the UN's latest integrated food classification security phase report shows hundreds of thousands of Palestinians are facing catastrophic levels of acute food insecurity involving an extreme lack of food, starvation and exhaustion. The conflict is out of control and engulfing the West Bank as the awful images of a wounded Palestinian strapped to the bonnet of an Israeli military jeep sped past ambulances rushing to the latest scene. The war threatens the entire region as the bellicose and Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu uh, casually states that Israeli forces will soon also move onto the Lebanon border. Now, this has all got to stop. The collective punishment of Palestinians must end, and by denying Palestinian statehood internationally, we are all complicit in this collective punishment. And, presiding officer, I have Israeli friends who support ending this outrageous treatment of their neighbours, and they deserve our support also. I must commend my colleague Hamza Youssef in bringing this motion before us today, a motion which states that Palestinian statehood is an inalienable right of the people of Palestine, not just a privilege that can be vetoed by others. We must halt the endless cycle of violence and bloodshed, start a viable path for peace between Israel and Palestine, and see the immediate recognition of a Palestinian state. That's essential. We need to see an end to this conflict, an end to the flagrant flouting of international law, and an end to the complicity of an enabling UK state. This is something the people we represent want to see. Yet, as the UK prepares to vote, the silence around their position on Palestine is shameful. Reading a recent article in Palestine by The Guardian columnist Owen Jones, I was struck by the opening line, a simple question, is this a serious country or not? A simple answer, no. The outgoing Prime Minister has given his full backing to Israel's genocidal response to the 7th of October attacks, 
happy to flout the rulings of the globally recognised International Court of Justice in continuing to provide arms and continuing to enable Israel in conducting its ongoing Rafah offensive in flagrant breach of ICJ ruling. This ruling, the International Criminal Court, has issued arrest warrants for our against Benjamin Netanyahu, against others. The UK, meanwhile, states that the ICC has no jurisdiction in willful ignorance to the reality that, as a signatory itself to the Rome Statute, the ICC does, in fact, have the power to investigate and issue rulings. Recognising a Palestinian state would remove any of this willful ignorance. And that's why it's so important to do so, and to do so now. Recognising a Palestinian state would also furnish Palestine with the same rights and obligations of any state, providing Palestine with equality going forward in negotiations with Israel to create a future as an equal partner, demanding and, and obligated to peace a serious peace, a lasting peace, and a just peace. And if we are to be a serious country, we must recognise this. We must respect international law, and we must join the 143 states in the UN who have voted by immediately recognising the state of Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Beatrice Wishart to be followed by Richard Leonard up to four minutes. Ms Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak on behalf of Scottish Liberal Democrats in today's incredibly important debate. I would like to start by thanking Hamza Youssef for bringing this debate to the Chamber this afternoon and how, as First Minister, he chose to use that office and his voice to speak up for peaceful solutions. Presiding officer, we have all looked on in horror at the scenes of devastation that have played out in Israel and Gaza. The terrorist attacks on 7 October and the subsequent conflict in Gaza have seen thousands of innocent people killed, and it has been horrifying. Right now, there is a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, the health systems collapsed, and international institutions are warning of the risk of famine. There is also the tragic ongoing hostage crisis, with over 100 Israelis still being held hostage by Hamas following the 7 October atrocities. We are also very concerned about the way that this conflict has turned the entire region into a tinderbox on the brink of serious escalation. For months, the Liberal Democrats have been calling for an immediate bilateral ceasefire because we urgently need to stop the humanitarian devastation in Gaza, get the hostages out and make the space for a political process leading to a two-state solution and lasting peace. Not only this, but an immediate bilateral ceasefire will help deliver the de-escalation which the region desperately needs. At this dark moment, the UK Government should be doing all that it can to stop the violence, secure an immediate bilateral ceasefire and bring about a two-state solution. One of the strongest cards the United Kingdom holds is the ability to immediately recognise Palestine as a state, and it is time for us to do so. Liberal Democrats have long called for the immediate recognition of the state of Palestine. It has been our policy since 2017. Leila Moran, the first British Palestine, Palestinian MP, has tabled on multiple occasions a private member's bill in the UK Parliament which would recognise Palestine as a state. The UK has both historic obligations in the region and modern responsibilities under international law. There are those who would say that recognising the state of Palestine would be meaningless, that it wouldn't have any practical consequence. But it is important that we do not underestimate the extent to which the UK's voice is listened to in the region. If we and our allies recognise Palestine, Palestine, then we will be able to fully join international institutions like the UN and the World Bank. This step would provide hope for millions of Palestinians that peace and a Palestinian state is possible. Liberal Democrats have also urged the UK Government to cease the export of British arms to Israel given the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Liberal Democrats have long advocated a two-state solution. A lasting peace is the only way to deliver the security and dignity which Israelis and Palestinians deserve. For the security of both peoples, Hamas cannot be allowed to continue to be in charge of Gaza. International law must be upheld, and the rulings of international courts must be respected. Thank you. Thank you.
And I call uh, Richard Leonard to be followed by James Dornan. Up to four minutes, Mr Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Humza Yusuf for uh, bringing this important motion to Parliament? Uh, we have a direct historic responsibility for the injustice perpetrated on Palestine and on the Palestinians. And therefore, we have a direct and distinctive responsibility for securing justice for Palestine and the Palestinians. For without justice, there will be no lasting peace. Arthur James Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, born only 25 miles from here in East Lothian, declared in 1917, His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Now, that single sentence signalled that Imperial Britain was prepared to give away a land that did not belong to it, though with a condition. And let me repeat it, that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities. So when Franz Fano, the political radical, wrote in The Wretched of the Earth, when we revolt, it's not for a particular culture, we revolt simply because, for many reasons, we can no longer breathe. Well, I say the people of Palestine are in revolt because they can no longer breathe. In 1947, they lost more than half of their land in the UN partition plan. Three quarters of a million Palestinians were displaced at the start of the Nakba. This was not a one-off event. It grinds on and on to this day, as many of those dispossessed and displaced by force and their descendants are now forcibly dispossessed and forcibly displaced again inside Gaza. Since 2008, there have been five, five major conflicts and wars in Gaza. Settler colonisation in the West Bank has grown at the fastest rate ever. There are now half a million settlers living there. This cannot carry on. And now the Palestinians are facing dispossession again are being forced into exile again, being forced to become refugees again. Yet, like so many already living in the refugee camps of Lebanon, Jordan and Syria, and those scattered across the world, many will hold keys, literally hold the physical keys of their homes, and all of them will hold the dream of one day returning. So, of course, we condemn the attacks of October the 7th, but history did not begin on October the 7th, 2023. So we need our government to use its influence as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council because of that historic, that distinctive, that, that direct responsibility to ensure that aid is escalated and arming is not just de-escalated, but stopped altogether. Not one more drone, not one more gun, not one more bullet, not one more license, but we need to go further. The plight of the Palestinians is not simply a humanitarian emergency. The question of Palestine can only be answered politically. So let us understand in full this injustice. Let us accept in full the part which our country played in that. Let us face up in full to the future that this is not just a question of power in a post-colonial age, this is not just a question of human and civil rights, this is a question of our moral code, our moral responsibility, our moral duty. So let us join with those on the right side of history today. Let us recognise Palestine now. Thank you. Before calling the next uh, speaker, I'm conscious there are a number of members that still wish to participate in the debate and therefore I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 of Standing Orders to extend the debate uh, by up to 30 minutes. I invite Hamza Youssef to move such a motion. Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed?
Uh, that is agreed. Thank you. I now call James Dornan to be followed by Carol Mockin. Uh, up to four minutes, Mr Dornan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, we could spend our allotted time listing the countless cases of deliberate slaughter of men, women and children that have occurred since and during the events of the 7th of October. We could easily pretend that all the acts of genocide and ethnic cleansing that have occurred since then are a result of that day. However, to do that would be to live in a world that denies facts and history of both that region and the United Kingdom. Without the betrayal of the indigenous population of the people of Palestine, primarily by the British, we would not be here. Recognising the state of, the Palestine, of state of Palestine is the very least that the UK owes the people of Palestine. I remember well the horror of 7th of October last year, imagining the fear that those poor young people out enjoying themselves at a music festival must have felt when terror arrived. And I suspect I'm not alone in seeing my sympathies lie with the people of Israel on that in the coming days. However, I would also bet that I was not alone in fearing what would happen next. We're told that Mossad is the greatest intelligence agency in the world and that the IDF, the most moral army, yet strangely, between those two organisations, they were completely unable to find the culprits who carried out the 7th of October terrorist acts. Instead, Netanyahu, a man who hangs on to power solely to stay out of prison, decided it was time to clear out the people of Gaza once and for all. He set the dogs on the innocents in a pretended attempt to root out the guilty. He okayed the slaughter of children, women and elderly because he saw them as less important than his own future. And you know what's worse than that? He got international backing to do so. Whilst he was bombing safe havens, hospitals and refugee camps, the UK and the USA were happily continuing to support him, including up to selling him weapons, all for domestic political purposes. Presiding officer, it's fitting that today's debate has been brought forward by my friend and colleague, Hamza Youssef. When the events of 7th October happened, he was the first to show his support to the Jewish community of Scotland. On this, he was joined by all the other political leaders. When the genocide began, Hamza stood up for the people of Gaza, but this time he was alone. Whilst other leaders awaited instructions from elsewhere, Hamza stood up and stood strong, and we should never forget the humanity he showed and the courage it takes to make yourself visible like that. All of this whilst, of course, he had family under the threat of ethnic cleansing that was taking place. This is a mark of a good man. Besides, officer, the conflict in Palestine has been a long one, though last year's events saw the conflicts escalate to new levels of violence. I'm sure those whose memories go back that bit further than the latest news cycles will know that Palestine has been slowly and methodically annexed by illegal settlers for decades now, backed by the Israeli army. According to the UN, between 2008 and 2021, there were 23 Palestinians killed for every Israeli. 22% of them were children and 10% were women. Of course, none of these killings are a good thing, but these figures are a sharp reminder of the military imbalance in this area. And now the Palestinians face the might of a US and UK-backed Israeli army, which seems intent on committing war crime after war crime and ultimately genocide against them in an attempt to ethnically cleanse the region. It's to the eternal shame of the UK government that they continue to back the Netanyahu regime, which was, has carried out such atrocities in Palestine and continues to do so on a daily basis. And given Keir Starmer's comments, I don't hold out much hope for an incoming Labour government to be any different. The SNP is a long and honourable tradition of believing in the right of all nations to self-determination and the right to govern themselves in their own interest. We believe Palestine is a nation and should be recognised as a state by the United Kingdom immediately. This is undoubtedly what we would do if Scotland were independent right now, and it's what our neighbours in Ireland, Spain and Norway have done. The situation in Gaza has been a humanitarian disaster, with food convoys being shot at and aid workers murdered by Israeli forces. The first step in the way out of this barbarity is to recognise that Palestine is a sovereign state in its own right. A two-state solution must be brokered, and either the UK is part of the solution along with our friends and neighbours in Europe and beyond, or it is once again, as we've seen so often in the Stark imperial history, a large part of the problem. 146 countries in the UN recognise Palestine. Will the UK make it 147? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Carol Mochen to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Up to four minutes, Ms Mochen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I, of course, thank Hamza Yusuf for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. 
during a time where eyes have begun to turn away from the atrocities and horrors being inflicted on the people of Palestine. It is important that we here in this place continue to raise those voices. I, and I know along with many other members across this chamber, believe that Palestine is the moral question of our time and that the matter has not been just about standing up for a ceasefire in the here and now, but as others have said this evening and in previous debates in this chamber, over 75 years after the Palestinians were promised a state of their own and after 56 years of illegal occupation, more than 100 countries now recognise Palestine and it is not out of step to do so. Where one stands on the question matters. It matters because we must care about the future for Israel and Palestine and the hopes and the futures of all Israelis and Palestinians depend on what we do. As a citizen of one of the most powerful countries in the world, I feel desperately ashamed that weapons that are funded from the UK have been used to perpetuate the, this terrible episode in human history. No amount of GDP is worth being involved in that. Security and peace is what we need for this region, and internationally we need to place pressure on the Netanyahu government, and I think in this chamber we all recognise this. Like others, I have wept as in Gaza entire families have been killed. Children have woken up to find the refugee camps they are living in with barely enough food or water completely ablaze after bombs were dro dropped on tents. Aid workers and journalists murdered in cold blood simply for trying to help people or to get to the truth. All of this is going on as we speak, and it will still be going on tomorrow. How can we do anything other than speak up? We have a moral responsibility to do so. As others have said, we need to recognise the root causes and address them. And this moves us to recognising a Palestinian state and a two-state solution. The reality of the situation as it stands is innocent people, including thousands of women and children and unborn children, are being punished for a crime that they did not commit. Now, I thank Mr Yusuf for his stance at the time when he was First Minister. It was most welcome. He welcomed the support from Scottish Labour and across the chamber, and I believe it reflected the overwhelming view here in Scotland that we must strive for peace and reconciliation. Scotland must continue to use its voice whenever it can to draw attention to the plight of the Palestinians. We cannot let this be swept under the carpet because it is that kind of attitude that has led to the constant instability in the region and the rise of leaders who are determined to use violence to get what they want. Let me end by saying this to governments around the world, selling we weapons to a nation that is indiscriminately bombing civilian population centres. This is not a benign act. To conclude, Presiding Officer, we have seen unimaginable scenes across from Gaza of destruction, death, and across the world we must speak out, stop the killing, bring the hostages home, and recognise the state of Palestine so that we can begin the process of peace. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call the final speaker in the open debate, Maggie Chapman, up to four minutes, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I am very grateful to Hamza Youssef for lodging his motion and securing this evening's debate, and I echo others' comments recognising his leadership on this issue. I know that many people around Scotland will be watching us to see what we in this place say and do about the awful genocide that is wreaking death and destruction across Gaza. I believe that those of us who have consistently been calling for a ceasefire for over eight months and calling for the world to recognise the state of Palestine for much longer than that will in time be shown to have been on the right side of history. We need peace in the lands of Palestine and Israel. We so desperately need peace. And that peace must be a just peace. The ongoing conflict between Israel and the Palestinians has roots going back over a century and a peaceful resolution while not simple, is a moral imperative. Because we come to this debate after the deaths of tens, tens of thousands of civilians, after the murder of children and healthcare workers, after the destruction of hospitals, 
universities, libraries and schools. We come to this at a time when Israeli occupation forces used an injured Palestinian as a human shield, strapped to the front of a military vehicle. We come to this debate when Israel is not just bombarding Gaza, but restricting services and support across the occupied territories. Israel has stopped transferring tax collected from Palestinians to the Palestinian Authority, so public sector workers haven't been paid for months. Israel was given control over Palestinian tax and customs in the Oslo Accords in the 1990s. That Oslo process saw the then Palestinian Liberation Organization recognize the state of Israel. Indeed, the PLO did what was asked of it in those accords. But since then, and it and the now Palestinian Authority have been consistently undermined by the forces of occupation and apartheid. Education of young Palestinians, an inalienable human right, is being restricted because Palestin the Palestinian Authority has not received the money it needs to pay teachers' wages, if indeed they still have schools to teach in. The same is true of health care, another inalienable human right. I want to say just a bit too about the attacks on UNRWA. When the International Court of Justice instructed Israel to ensure that sufficient aid was provided in Gaza, the immediate response was not to make that aid available, but to claim that UNRWA was implicated in the 7th of October attacks. No evidence of this has ever been produced. More UN workers have been killed in this war than in any other. Hundreds of aid installations destroyed and damaged, so compromising UNRWA's ability to do its life-saving work. International humanitarian law, particularly the Geneva Convention, emphasises the protection and assistance of civilians. Defunding and otherwise compromising UNRWA's, uh, UNRWA's attempts undermines these protections. So we must apply all the international pressure we can on Israel to stop acting in bad faith and for the UK and US to reinstate support for UNRWA, to stop sending arms to Israel and to recognise the state of Palestine. Because a just peace cannot be achieved by the obliteration of a people and the destruction of their world. I have a different position to others on the issue of a two-state solution, one shared by many workers for peace in Israel and Palestine. The occupation of East Jerusalem makes such a proposal unworkable, I believe, as do the illegal settlements in the West Bank. And I would urge colleagues to read Jeff Halper's writing on this. However, this difference does not diminish my support for the immediate recognition of the state of Palestine, for the end to supplying arms to Israel, and for a ceasefire. I believe the Palestinian people should be given the power and the means to determine their own future. Mm -hmm. To conclude, Presiding Officer, I will share the words of Shahid Badir, a 13-year-old Palestinian child whose poem, Mother Palestine, has been on display in the Scottish Poetry Library as part of the Hands Up Project, Moon Tell Me Truth exhibition. Sadness in her eyes as everyone dies. She remembers the old days, how beautiful she was. But no one can realise that she wants to survive. Everyone, everywhere, must realise that Palestine deserves life. Thank you. And I now call on the Cabinet Secretary uh, to wind up the debate around seven minutes. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I would like to um, thank Hamza Youssef for securing this important debate. And at the outset, I would like to pay tribute uh, to him for his principled stance on this issue as a Minister, as a Cabinet Secretary, as First Minister, and today um, as a member of the Scottish Parliament. He has been a voice for victims of this terrible conflict from the very beginning as well as an advocate of tolerance at home, speaking out against all forms of discrimination, including Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. I take the opportunity to also pay tribute to all members who have spoken so powerfully in this debate. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has welcomed Ireland, Norway, Spain and Slovenia, who have joined with 141 other states in recognising the state of Palestine. And today we were uh, updated that um, the Republic of Armenia has done likewise too. The First Minister wrote to the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition on the 28th of May to call on the United Kingdom to do the same. I reiterate this call for the UK to review its position following the recent welcome decision by our European neighbours. Recognition would offer hope to Palestinians that a just, that a durable political solution is possible and would allow Israel and Palestine to move towards long-term peace and stability, which is in the interest of all parties. 
While it may sometimes seem a distant prospect, the Scottish Government continues to support the UK and EU positions of a two-state solution that respects the human rights of everyone in the region to ensure that a secure Israel can live peacefully alongside a viable and a sovereign Palestinian state. Only through such an outcome can the cycle of violence that is killing and injuring so many innocent civilians be ended. The Scottish Government has been consistent in condemning unequivocally the abhorrent terrorist actions of Hamas and in calling for an immediate and a permanent ceasefire by all sides in Israel and in Gaza. A ceasefire is the only way that we can halt the catastrophic human suffering in Gaza and for all of the hostages to be released. I repeat the Scottish Government's demand for Hamas to release immediately and unconditionally all hostages and to cease all missile attacks against Israel. Hamas can have no future in Gaza. But the cycle of violence must end. The rockets, the bombings must stop. Humanitarian and medical facilities must be protected and civilians must be given unrestricted access to the basic necessities of life wherever they are. May I take the opportunity to commend the generosity of aid organisations and community groups across Scotland, including in Hamza Yusuf's constituency of Glasgow Pollock, for their generosity in sending aid to ease the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. This generosity is consistent with the outpouring of support ordinary Scots have provided for innocent victims of conflict elsewhere, most recently in Ukraine. The Scottish Government has also responded to the humanitarian crisis in Gaza through committing £750,000 of Scotland's international aid to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency's flash appeal. Presiding officer, having been repeatedly displaced, an estimated 1.3 million Palestinians are sheltering in tent camps and cramped apartments desperate for food, desperate for water, desperate for medical supplies. The health system, along with much of the infrastructure in Gaza, has been decimated. Life-saving aid has been systematically blocked from entering the territory in contravention of international law. And the International Court of Justice has been crystal clear that Israel must ensure unimpeded access to Gaza for humanitarian aid. So I urge all parties to step up their efforts to agree a ceasefire urgently so that the hostages can at last be reunited with their families, the bombing can stop, and the unimaginable suffering that this conflict has caused can finally end. The Scottish Government does not believe that there is a case to send more weapons to Israel. The UN Security Council has called for a ceasefire in Gaza, and ministers have made clear that by continuing to arm Israel, the UK is in danger of being complicit in killing innocent civilians. The former First Minister himself wrote to the Prime Minister calling for a ban on arms exports to Israel, a call that has not yet been heeded. We will continue to press the UK Government on this issue. Today, in this Parliament, we have been overwhelmingly agreed that Palestine must be recognised as an independent state. Doing nothing is not an option. The UK should join the international community and do the right thing. Recognise Palestine as an independent state, secure a ceasefire and a two-state solution so Palestine and Israel can live in peace in security, prosperity and independence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.